So I discovered a new uh, music site where musicians that are distributed through DistroKid log in and comment on each other's tunes. Mostly nice things, actually. It's called Slaps. And it's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. It's very addictive. So it's a bit like SoundCloud. So when you make a comment, it shows up at the point in the song where you made the comment. And then instead of liking something, you hit fire. Uh, that's, that seems a little strange to me. But yeah, fire, like burn it. But uh, yeah, and then you can add it to your collection. Slaps. It's created by DistroKid, and they handle all my distribution to streaming. It's pretty interesting, I think. You oh, should check it out. Okay, I will. The, I, I think I, the only music site I go to is like Bandcamp. I mean, I, yeah, I, I this is like a radio. Ra so what? Ra radio? Slaps.com is where it is. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's it's a, it's a range of stuff. There's some great stuff, and there's some interesting stuff, and not so interesting stuff. But I thought you I thought you announced in, in our last show that you you had buckled and rejoined the the rejoined Spotify. Yes, the Spotify Borg. I have um, I have an account, and my music is up there, and. Um, Yes, indeed. It's all there. Okay. So how does this differ? So slaps is a different kind of a thing. It's, it's um, you know, yes, you're presented with a playlist, and you can look at what's new or what's trending. And um, the songs come up in a variety of genres, but you can select sort of a limited set of genres they have. Uh, electronic singer, songwriter, folk, an honest, unsigned artist, hip hop, rock, alternative, rock, jazz, or pop. And um, you can choose, you know, a playlist from those. And, you know, people miscategorize their stuff. So that's sort of part of the deal. And then uh, you listen and you can comment on the, on the tunes as they go by. You can skip them if you don't want, you know, if you have nothing to say. Um, mm -hmm. And it builds a it builds sort of a record of how many comments you've made, and if you're an artist, you need to make a certain number of comments before you can upload your own material. So, you know, let's say I want to upload four songs, I would probably have to comment on like twenty, thirty different other songs. So it okay. encourages that interaction. But Spotify is a different thing. So free Spotify, you get to listen to whatever's on Spotify, which is pretty much everything. Um, and if it's free, it automatically chooses the next song for you. You can't like go through a whole album. You right. have to pay for premium to do that. Uh, and that's how they, that's part of how they make their money. Mm. And you get ads if it's free. Mm. So, yeah. Uh, we're, this podcast is now on Spotify. Because oh. they also, they also host podcasts. Oh. So I've been busy. I had to actually move most of my material. I'm in the process of moving my material from CD Baby, which is another distributor to streaming services, over to DistroKid because uh, CD Baby is a real mess to work with. And uh, it was sort of a default because I started using them back when they pressed CDs, right? Uh, which is why they're called CD Baby. And then they moved into the streaming service and discontinued pressing CDs or keeping any stock. And so... Um, they stopped being a physical store and they're Was CD just... Baby like a, a company that one of our friends started? CD Baby. Uh, now it was actually Baby, wasn't it like children's songs or something? I don't remember. I, I, it was, oh man, I'm going to forget now. It was started by Derek Sivers, I believe. And I know him, but I don't know if, I don't know that you know him. Derek Sivers? No. I've just, no. I just met him at the conferences and stuff and we've talked a little bit. Um, Phil, Phil Antoniata started a similar company called Nimbit, which I don't even know if they're in business now, but they also moved to streaming and they may have closed up shop entirely. Um, there's only a few distribution services. I mean, you have to go through one of these middlemen in order to get your stuff out to, you know, the 36 different streaming platforms that are out there. 
And so they package everything up. You upload the raw, the raw audio. You give all the information about it. You say, yeah, I recorded all of it. It's all mine. And then it assigns these ISRC numbers to, to all your tracks and then sends it out to all the different streaming services. You know, if, when we have David Herlihy on the program, uh, he can talk about this in detail. He's, he's, he knows a lot more than I do. Okay. Yeah. But I, I just know from, you know, what I've been experimenting with here. And then Slaps is part of DistroKid. So Slaps uh, is sort of a service for people on DistroKid to put up their stuff. And the thing is, I actually think it'd be fun for anyone to listen through to it. So I don't think it necessarily... It doesn't necessarily have to be that you, you know, are putting out music on DistroKid if you would just want to go and listen. I'll check it out. Yeah. Um, and I think what, you know, you'll find some gems and you'll have to sift through a lot of slag to get it. But, you know, <laughs> the stuff that's up there that's interesting, I mean, I can point you in the direction of some people, but um, it's new. It's something you've never heard of. It's definitely people who are just, you know, making stuff at home and then putting it up. It mm -hmm. has that homemade feel, the four tracks. So okay. it's sort of interesting. So what, what have you been up to since we last talked talk to Kurt? Um, the usual. Um, nothing, nothing particularly exciting has happened, but I don't think that's going to fly very far in a podcast. I have been mm. thinking about things, but I don't want to take the stage if there's something you wish to discuss, if there's something on your mind, a burning issue on your mind that you want to, that you want to well, discuss. Yeah, over the past two weeks, I've read a book called The Ends of the World, plural, ends. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I will just give me a second while I bring it up so I can say who the author is because I've completely forgotten. Um, so it is written by Peter Brannan. And uh, the full title is The Ends of the World, Volcanic Apoc Apocalypses, Lethal Oceans, and Our Quest to Understand Earth's Past Mass Extinctions. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a fascinating book. It, it goes through all the, the past mass extinctions and kind of how really, truly devastating they were. The great but, oxidization event, oxidation yes, event, and the KP yeah. extinction, the, yes. the great dying. That was the great dying. I think that was the number one bad one. And um, the dicameral extinction, I don't remember all the names. There's a really early one that nobody focuses on because all the animals in the fossil record are all, they all look the same. <laughs> it's like, you know... <laughs> Geologists are not that interested in this because it's just like everything you find is like looks like a horseshoe crab or I don't I don't remember maybe it's, it's a jellyfish. <laughs> Trilobite. Yeah. Or it might just be like a you know like a an early uh sea plant um like a fern but right. yeah it's not it's it it's not it's not too fascinating but there was an extinction and and generally all extinctions are linked to carbon. Um is one of the main points of the book. And then it just becomes just truly horrendously terrifying and depressing toward the end. Um, and I had kind of, I had heard about it as someone, someone who described it as saying, you know, when you really look at the real mass extinction events, uh, we're, we're far from uh, creating one ourselves. But I, reading this book, I did not get that. I did not get that impression. So uh, I don't know whether I can recommend this book. I, I think you have to have a strong mental constitution to deal with kind of the the substance of it. Oh, huh. yeah. So it's uh, a, but it's a good book in terms of just over, an overview of of paleo. I mean, I, I forget yeah. the exact. I mean, of yeah. the science involved of of life on Earth and the history of these extinctions. They're they're fascinating. The the great oxidation event. I forget what caused the great. I mean, we all know about the dinosaurs and the asteroid, you know. Right. That's a big right. One. But that uh, that's called into question in this book. He doesn't he doesn't completely debunk it. He does mention people who are uh, saying that the asteroid may have been in conjunction with other uh, 
yes, other events is, that were leading yeah. toward the extinction of the dinosaurs anyway, and those were actually carbon driven as well. The um, great oxidation. So he describes the cycle wherein the, you know, when when carbon gets uh, is too high on in planet Earth, obviously things warm tremendously, uh, but part of that cycle of warming draws down uh, draws down carbon from the atmosphere and it ends up in limestone. Of course, it end, this takes many thousands of years uh, for that to happen. So it's not really useful for our purposes unless we can dramatically speed things up. Uh -huh. um, but uh, uh, I mean, that's, I mean, in some ways there's the kernel of where we need to put our efforts, you know, and, and part of that is definitely drawing down carbon um, uh -huh. in a truly severe way. Um, but, um, that, uh, so the great oxidation actually happened because of a high carbon event. And then over the course of, of thousands of years, um, that carbon, uh, was recaptured so efficiently that we then had, uh, too much atmosphere. 30% of the, of the atmosphere was oxygen and it's currently 21%. Right. So you can imagine uh, some problems with that. I mean, first of all, forest fires, and then um, uh, it's starved. It starved off some other kind of. You know, I don't. I don't have full retention of everything that he said. But yes, it's full of information about um, the archaeological evidence and and geology and um, uh, well, the geological evidence and and it really puts things in a very very big perspective. Mm -hmm. He kind of goes as 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 wide as he possibly can. Yeah, there's one where like ninety eight, like ninety eight percent of sea species and ninety two percent of all land species were wiped out. I mean, we're talking right. about we're talking about really significant die offs. Yeah, yeah, ridiculous yeah. stuff. Like, how did anything survive at all? Yeah, yeah, that's I mean and that's um that's definitely part of part of what he goes into and 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 there's a commonality to all of these extinction events. I mean again, um they all share generally high or low carbon in the atmosphere and um usually high carbon in the atmosphere. And then there was one that caused ocean acidification that that you know that was the one that really limited the range of life on earth for a very long time oh so um yeah it's i mean it's a heavy book and uh i somehow i somehow got into it i don't i don't know that uh i i'm not sure i wish i had but um there it is if you if you can handle it uh give it a shot the ends of the world so strangely enough you touched on something that I was getting ready to launch into anyway. Mm -hmm. So do you want me to launch or do you have something launch. else you wish? To launch away. That's what I got. So one of the episodes in the history of science that I always find fascinating is the evolution of thought about the age of the earth. Mm, yeah. And this has become, you know, you can't throw, you can't throw a stick without hitting somebody who knows that, you know, the Bible According to the Bible, Earth was created in 4004 BC or something like that. Right. Um, but the interesting thing is there's there's a there's there's this lineage of prof of uh, scientists, Cuvier and Lyle and Hutton um, and all these people who over time start to figure out that the Earth is a lot older than that. Right. Um, and how they do that. And one of the interesting things that I liked was Mount Etna. Hmm. So one of the things that people have noticed for a long time is that there's these things called fossils. Right. And I haven't done an enormous amount of study about this yet, but there's a lot of wacky theories about where fossils came from in like, you know, 1400 AD. Mm -hmm. Um, that they're, they're some kind of a, they, they naturally occur in the soil. They're just accretions. They, they really don't bear relationship to living things now, mm -hmm. but eventually calmer heads kind of prevailed and people <laughs> looked at fossils and said, Hey, it's really interesting. There's fossils in the soil and the fossils near the top look a lot like things that are around us. There's things in there that look like fishes and animals that are around us. And as we go down farther and farther, they look more different. 
Uh-huh. Isn't that funny? Isn't that isn't that bizarre? Um, and so they 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 figure that out, and then what they do is um, one guy. I'm sorry. I think I think it is um, Lyle. I'm probably screwing this up. My God, no, it it may be Cuvier. Any anyway, anyway, but it's a very famous one where the guy goes to Etna, mm-hmm. and he says, "Okay, there are fossils underneath Etna, like at the base of Etna. You, with Etna, you can tell very clearly the part of the cone that was formed from volcanic flows." Right, and, and that the, is in Sicily, right? Yeah, Am I, yeah, it's a, okay. Yeah, it's a volcano in Sicily. Yeah, and if you go near the base of Etna, you can see where the flows have stopped, and and there, theoretically, at that place, you're looking at what was present before Etna started creating itself. Um, right, like in the beginning, there was this plain. And then Etna just starts bubbling out lava for however long that is, and then right. it gets to a certain size. And so what the guy did was um, he said, "Okay, if we if we if we walk down to the base of Etna and we look at the plane, we look at the fossils in that plane, we notice that they're very similar to the fossils around this." And I think it's starting to sink into people. It's like, "Okay, look, whatever the the fossils near the top, it's in time. Like the stuff at the top is more recent in time, and the stuff down below." is farther back in time. Right. right. Okay. So the stuff at the very top is um is, is the more is the most recent stuff. And so what he does then is he he has records going back to Roman times. There's there's actually very good records of how many times Etna has blown its top. And there's very good records hmm. about how on it's a very regular volcano. It blows its top at fairly regular intervals and deposits a certain amount of lava or whatever it's called. Um, and yeah. you can see it. You can look at it. And so he goes there and he does the calculation. Um, and uh, what he's assuming is that um, – and so what he does, he calculates it and he finds out and he says, okay, if Etna blows its top 10 times every hundred years and it deposits this much cubic feet of lava every time it does, yeah, holy shit, <laughs> it's yeah. taken a long time for Etna to get this big. I mean, like, whoa. Right. We're talking millions and millions of years. Right. Oh, and by the way, the fossils underneath Etna look just like things that are alive today. Okay, right. Ergo, life forms, first off, the, and, and then underneath those fossils are another mile of fossils that go back further back in time. Right, right. So the whole point is that if, if it's taken Etna 40 million years right. to build itself, and what's underneath Etna is something that looks almost identical to to what's alive today on the earth um the earth people is a lot older than we think and in fact right. what they did is they went on a limb and says you know the, they said like the earth is you know they they said ridiculous things that blew everybody's like the earth is 140 million years old right right you know and now we know the earth it's more like 4 billion years old right um but life is like 2 billion i think the earth is about 4 billion and life's about 2 billion or 1 billion i don't know not, mm-hmm. today's not the day to get me precise on these things um so i always love that because it's a really really simple thing i mean you don't need a particle collider you don't need a slide rule you, you don't need a computer right you just need you need to use your head and arithmetic and figure it out and um so all these guys were talking about so it it leads to um oh i think i think i know who it is um uh, but his name will come back to me. It's a Danish guy. Um, okay. And, but it's really early. Um, and, and that comes, they come up with the, the study of stratigraphy, which is the hmm. study the of strata. the layers of the soil, the layers of soil and the fossils that leads to paleontology, which is the fossil record in the layers of soil and what it all means and uh, all this kind of stuff. And the, the other guy who the, the, the really famous one is Lyle. Um, mm-hmm. and he's the one because everybody said, okay, well, there's all this weird stuff in the soil, but it's all because there was this great flood. 
and the mm-hmm. great flood moved all these animals. That's why you find seashells on top of mountaintops because there is a big flood and they're generally called the catastrophists. Um, mm-hmm. And what Lyle, who is part of the Scottish Renaissance in the 1700s and a brilliant man. And what he, he is the founder of uniform, uh, uniformitarianism or you, it basically, he says the past is the key to, the, to today. There, there were mm-hmm. no disasters. The forces that are at work today are the same forces that have been at work forever. And right. his famous one was he went to this um, he went to this famous beach in Scotland where you have um, you have rock strata going perfectly vertical. Uh-huh. Um, you have layers of rock that are perfectly vertical, and on top of those are perfectly horizontal layers of rock. Um, And what he said is that um, what this means is that the original layers were deposited on the bottom of the ocean and then something happened, which caused those layers to buckle Mm. like, like an accordion to buckle and then come above the ocean to be raised up. So you have sort of like this, I don't know what you'd call it, this curly Q thing, like, you know, what they put on wedding cakes, you know, it's, uh, but it's, it's, it's a curly cue thing. And then erosion sort of slices the top off all the loops. So now all you have is just a whole bunch of vertical plates. And then on top of that was deposited a new, and then it was plunged back down into the ocean. And then a new horizontal layer was put on top of it. And then it was shoved back up. And basically what he says is I agree with the guy in that. Now, man, this has been going on for a long time. I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, he, he said, uh, you know, there's a lot of famous quotes from Lyle, um, you know, he says, uh, he says, there's no hint of a past and no vestige of a few uh, of an end. There's no hint of a beginning and no vestige of an end. Like we're talking, you're talking about deep time, right? So that's all, that's all well and good. That's interesting in and of itself. But the thing I found even more fascinating is that these guys were all predated by Leonardo da Vinci. Hmm. And in his notebooks, he talked about many of these same ideas. He said, hey, look, I was walking around yesterday in, in the Dolomites or <laughs> whatever it was, uh-huh. and I yeah. noticed that, you know, the rocks are shaped like this, and this happens and that happens. And, you know, it's obvious that what's happening here is that the rocks are being layered by sedimentation, and then they get buckled by geological forces, and then they get thrust up. And that means that everything's, like, really, really old around here. I'm going to get lunch, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> and the thing to me is... I find fast. And so I I haven't even really got to my point. My point that I'm really thinking about is why do we know about Lyle? And why do we know about Da Vinci? And why not Da Vinci? But more importantly than that, again, you don't need a mass spectrometer. You don't need an orbiting telescope. All you got to do is look. These guys had nothing in their hands and nothing. I mean, so. Why did they see it? First off, were they the first to see it? Or have people been seeing this for a really, 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 really long time? So so one possibility is that people have been seeing this for a long time. Uh-huh. But there wasn't, but something happened such that we don't celebrate them. Or we hmm. don't mention their names. Or B, they didn't. Now, Leonardo da Vinci's like what fourteen something, and I think this. Yeah. I think Piano and Cuvier is like early seventeen hundreds, so it's not that huge a distance. But still, while yeah. all of a sudden is Lyle coming up with this stuff, and Hutton and Cuvier um, and all these guys, why are they coming? What causes this ferment, and why do we know that story? Well, well, we don't know Leonardo, but even if you're not, even if it's not Leonardo da Vinci, I, there's really two very fine points here. The other thing is, so maybe there wasn't anybody before da Vinci, these guys, but if that's the case, why? Cause they didn't right. have any new technology. What they were just making observations, them? stuff that was, that was obviously there, like the Palisades. Yeah, they look, you you take your eye and you look at, I mean, the other thing I was uh, studying was the whole thing about Aristotle and ballistic flight. 
Aristotle uh-huh. said, oh, when you fire a ballistic object, when something's thrown or hurled somewhere, it goes in a straight line up in the air, and then at some magical point, it stops, and then it goes straight down. Mm-hmm. Now, any idiot in the world can stand there and watch somebody throw a ball and say, that's not how it happens. Right, right. And they, right. We've, had, we've had bows and arrows for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Yeah, and in order to hit something, you have to understand parabolas, at least intuitively. I'm not sure about that. I, I That seems like the next, next logical thing. All I'm saying is that all you got to do is stand there and watch somebody throw something and say, dude, that's not what's happening. Right. It's going in a continuous curve. Right. And then the other thing they talk about is Leonardo da Vinci stands on top of a building and drops balls of different, you know, of different weights and notices mm-hmm. they hit the ground at the same time. Well, the last time I checked, they had towers in like Babylon. They had right. towers in Egypt. It's not a very complex experiment. <laughs> you stand <laughs> on a high place and you got a heavy ball and you got a light ball and you drop the things. And you don't need a very refined clock. You just need somebody standing at the bottom. So they hit at the same time. Right. They hit at the same time. I mean, you get a ball of cork and you get an enormous ball. Now, the problem was, you know, I mean, but this is the problem I have with a lot of history of science is that everybody says, oh, in you know, 1322, they finally discovered. It's like, no, they didn't. The, hmm. the phenomenon was always there. What changed? Well, the printing and, press. I mean, that's, that's one thing. But also, where was Lyle? Where, where, what country was he in? Lyle, Scotland. Scotland, okay. Uh, that's a little tricky. I mean, it's still the, the, yeah, the influence of the church, but... It, that would have been at the time that the church is split from uh, Catholicism, right? So after the after the rift, there may have been oh yeah thoughts no, no. about the age of the earth may have been have survived. Whereas thoughts about the age of the earth earlier, I mean Da Vinci, I mean he was getting paid by the church, so he's probably not going to publish something that says the earth is not six thousand years old or five. Right. So is it a chilling effect? Is it so? That's an interesting theory. So that's a good theory because my feeling is that people always saw this and people always knew that this was nuts. Right. But it didn't matter. I, I think I think at least there's two things that come into play there. One, it doesn't matter. Like everybody talks about, oh, you know, they, they all thought that the earth, you know, the sun went around the earth for thousands of years and weren't they stupid? And the answer yeah. is it didn't matter. Nobody – even today, who cares if the sun goes around the earth or the earth goes around the sun? I mean, honestly, what difference does that make to your life on a daily basis? I mean, that's the joke of right. Sherlock Holmes. There's a famous Sherlock Holmes story where he says, I don't keep, I don't have the heliocentric theory in my head because it's of no use to me. Well, I mean, um, so many things, though. I mean, in the age of Aristotle, so many things were decided by philosophy rather than by science. Science really wasn't, I mean, the art of experimentation was not something people did um so you just relied on somebody like aristotle and said well it should work this way because of platonic ideals and so you throw something up it goes straight up and then it comes straight down Um, i guess the reason why they bought it because it was obviously counterintuitive it didn't make any sense i mean aristotle evidence is everywhere yeah evidence is everywhere counter evidence is everywhere so the reason is why do people buy into this and the only thing i can so either a so one thing, one possible theory is that human beings have changed. They're like really stupid, you know, thousands of years ago, and they've gotten smarter. I don't think that's the case. I don't well, think that's the case. I would say like our quest for knowledge has been, become more like detectives and less like Sherlock Holmes in his drawing room trying to figure it out. So either way, you're creating a mental model of the age of the earth or the trajectory of objects and so the thing is though if you let evidence factor into it then you'll ha- end up with a better model you'll end up with a model that works better that, right you know either explains what the fossils are in a significant way or why we ha- see stars that are millions of light years away um and if you just rely on philosophy or on religion your models are not effective you couldn't build an airplane based on the bible right they're not really need to because that's not their job 
And that's yeah. what I think is the issue is that back then it didn't really matter. I mean, if you're an archer, you just know inherently how you're going to angle your bow to hit a, a target at a certain distance. You yep. don't need a parabolic equation. You don't need any equation at all. At a certain distance, you, really, you got to aim above the head, right? Well, you just yeah. you just know because you just do it. You stand there, you just pull, you fire a couple of hundred arrows, and after a while, you you get the idea that this is what I got to do to achieve this thing. You don't need a theory to mm -hmm. teach you. And they didn't. And and so, who cared? I mean, all the people really, uh, you know, what did people really care about? They really cared about knowing exactly when to plant the crops, and when to reap the crops, and when the when the water was going to get this high, and when the water is going to go down. Uh, and a bunch of things like that. But other than that, there's nothing much that science could do for them. Well, so, science, science can help you build a better, <clears throat> um, a better catapult, for example. I mean, you could not philosophically construct a catapult and have it work. Or plumbing. You know, these you things could, really... I, yeah. You yeah. Know, I think a lot of stuff was done by trial and error. And I think... Yeah. I think and also, here's another interesting, because I'm really thinking, because here's the big, here, I'll do the grand reveal. This is, this yeah. is my big. Oh, wait, wait, big stop for a second. Stop, stop, stop. It's piping. The curly Q stuff on top of the cake. Right. The one that goes up and down like this, like a ruffled collar. Oh, you right. know what I'm talking well, about? Like a ruffled collar yeah. where it's, it's, it's. There might be a better term for that, but I think it's piping. Okay. All right, I just, okay, I well, just uh, derailed okay. you there for a second. Yeah, yeah. You, you just completely broke the, the, yeah, but, the yeah, dramatic you, tension. Sorry. Yeah, well, sorry's don't count. Anyway, so <laughs> I think I'm just my, trying to get a little airtime here. I know. I'm sorry, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. You, you're absolutely right. Oh, that's all I have. I just have piping. That's, that's, oh, and well, no, I have a couple of other things. I mean, I had the thing about the times and the place that they live in. If you lived in Holland at the time during, before they got uh, ultra conservative, then you might be allowed to think about these things or do experiments and it, you know, you get past the church. Um, so, so that, or in America, right. If you were in, in New York or something, then you could do that. Not in Boston because of puritanical, but um, it's interesting to know that even with all of these observations, the tectonic plates were not discovered until 1953 by Mary Tharp, which I find that's something I find fascinating. Well, we'll get there. We'll get to the whole yeah. tectonic plates and and that whole because that's a that's a fascinating one. My question is this: why why didn't we invent everything all at once? I mean, if science is the progress of the intellect, and why didn't we why didn't we invent the theory of relativity? like a week after we invented algebra. Ah. Uh, and well, uh, I mean, you know, you need atomic clocks. They didn't have atomic clocks to develop relativity. They didn't? No. I no. I thought okay, no, they had atomic clocks to prove relativity. You're right. They Einstein proved it afterwards. They, yeah. But they had the yeah. Michelson Morley experiment, but still f okay, forget about relativity. Mm. But it's just like okay, like I, the imaginary number. Why did it take so long? I mean, you could think, I mean, if you, because when you look at it in, in the other direction, when you look backwards, it's like, oh, it's so logical. Right. It's so logical. Oh, the atomic theory. Oh, that's why this was happening. And DNA. Oh, that's why genealogy is happening. It was, it's right there in front of us. And it goes backwards. Oh, evolution. It's so obvious in 1865 that it goes, you know, why couldn't, you know, why do these things take time? Well, I mean, the number zero, for example, wasn't actually proposed as a number until like the year 500 in India. Right. So because why would you need zero? You know, you're counting things and things are either one or more. Um, but for mathematics, you need zero. True. So, you need so a it's a you need a positional notation. I mean, yeah. But no, but 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 it's interesting because you can do a lot of mathematics with Roman numerals, right? And 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 I'm trying to give it. I'm trying to work towards an answer. So and and so in the same way, a related issue is, you know, we talk about we talk about Copernicus coming up with the heliocentric version of the universe mm -hmm. that supplanted Ptolemy's geocentric 
model of the solar system. Right. Okay. But that's not really what happened. It's, it's exactly what happened. But what most people really care about is what's the new equations? I mean, the real reason why Copernicus developed the heliocentric thing was that the church went to him. He was a priest. Right. And the, the Catholic church went to him and said, trying to calculate the high holy days is a complete freaking nightmare right. with this Ptolemy crap. Right. Can you come up with something, an easier way for us to calculate calendars and time? And he said, yeah. He said, here's these equations. They work really well. Oh, mm. by the way, they're based on the idea that the Earth's going around the sun. Sorry, my bad. So, yeah. I'm going to die now. <laughs> yeah. Have fun. And enjoy yeah. the book. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole point is that what does it matter? We have we – have, every time we talk about these theories, we talk about these mind pictures. It's like, oh, the Earth goes around the sun, so the other way around. But honestly, that that's meaningless. What matters is the equations – well, it's not meaningless in – in one sense, you can look at it some in one way that it is meaningless because all you care about is the equations. All you need are those equations. But so, why are human beings so fascinated by these mind pictures? Because the mind pictures don't—you can't use a mind picture to tell you where to fire the Saturn V rocket at. You need no. the equations. You need the equations. That's but true. You, but you need the mind picture for something else. You need that isomorphism, that mind picture, so you can make further discoveries. We love mind pictures because once mm -hmm. you have a mind, because we're mapping, we're making, we've talked about this before, we're making an isomorphism. We're mapping one thing, like a set of equations, into a picture. And then we look at that picture as a picture and we say, oh, it's a picture with a house and a chimney. Oh, what would happen if smoke came out of the chimney? Mm -hmm. Oh, we we would have we'd have dna <laughs> and so we 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 right. map our thoughts yeah. into another realm and then within the laws of that realm we we come up with hypotheticals uh, based upon the rules in that realm and then we see if it makes sense oh if atoms are particles right. if atoms are little billiard balls and they should bang off of each other in these kind of rules like the way we bang billiard balls do they do that Right. Now, either they do, which is kind of boring, or they don't. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, we need a new mind map. We need a new a new picture in our head. Right. So why does it take time for us to discover stuff? Why does it take so long? Um, and why is it going so fast today? Is it just – I think there's possibly several things. Yeah. One is – so one thing I think is fascinating is the patent system hmm. because back in like 1200, if you discovered a really cool way of doing something, you kept your mouth shut because the only way you could – the only known form of intellectual property like before 1700 mm -hmm. was trade secret. You had to keep it a secret. And if it got out, it got out. So I bet you lots of things were discovered and lots of things were found out, but they died with their discoverers or they were past, they were little technological things like maybe a goldsmith who figured out how to do this really cool right, thing. Right, right. And it just stayed within the guild. Look, you guys, we're not going to tell anybody else. Guild right? secrets, right, right. Well, yeah, because exactly. it's competitive because there's no protection. If if the, if those if those bastards across the river get a, get their sweaty little peasant hands on our secret, they're not going to pay us anything. So we keep it. Um, it's like um, uh, the story of Venice, yeah, um, and the the glassmakers on Venice. That was a huge part of Venice's uh, uh, success was glassmaking. So much so. And also because the glassmakers tend to like burn down Venice every now and then <laughs> because they had all these kilns and shit like that, yeah. that they took all the glassmakers and they said, Hey, we're going to put you on the Island of Murano. Mm. Okay. And we'll, you, we'll, we'll, we'll give you all BMWs and you, you're going to have a great time. <laughs> yeah, and you can, you can, you can yeah. we'll give you a free cable, a free pay-per-view, yeah. and but you can't leave the Island. Mm -hmm. And this leads to another, and I'll stop after this because I really am sucking up all the oxygen in the room. But it leads to what I think. So, of course, this also leads into the other issue of why Western Europe? Why did Western? Why did this this thing that we call the scientific revolution happen in Western Europe? Um, 
because by all rights and all means, it should have happened in China um, Mm -hmm. or maybe Mm -hmm. India, Um, not in this hovel at the far left end of the, of the Eurasian. I mean, we were just a joke until like 1300. I mean, the Romans, maybe later. Yeah. But there was about a thousand years of absolute ignorance in Western Europe and just stinky ignorance as well. Right. Yeah. It was not romantic. Why here? And one of the things I'm fascinated by, and I, I, there's, there's two sets of two sets of technologies that I think are really, 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 well, no, at least one clear glass, Hmm. the invention of very affordable, incredibly pure, clear glass because without clear glass you don't have lenses Mm. and you don't have beakers right and if you don't have lenses you don't have microscopes you don't have telescopes you don't have you don't have uh uh, quadrants and and all those surveying instruments you don't have the 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 it's amazing if you sit down and think about it the ability to fabricate lenses is unbelievably a foundational technology much in the same way that today our world our quote-unquote modern world is unbelievably based yeah it's based on the transistor but just as much if not more so it's based on the laser and the fiber optic cable if you Mm. didn't have the late so many technologies today are based on the laser um all the way from measuring the distance to the moon to reattaching people's retinas to basically the entire internet. The internet really runs on lasers. Hmm. It runs on lasers pumping information down fiber optic. Right. But anyway, right. back to Murano, back to the invention of clear glass. If you have clear glass, you have lenses. And if you have clear glass, you can make beakers and you can see what's mm-hmm. happening in. So- Cause up to that point, what did you have? You had like, cl- you had ceramic, but you can't see through yeah, it. ceramics. So it gets really right. hard to like actually just see what's happening here, just just looking at it. And that sort of goes back to the whole idea of why we think in terms of mind pictures instead of equations, because mm. you need that ability to grasp it immediately and visually. You've got to look at it and you've got to see it and you have to have that rush of what is it? It turned blue. Right. Did you see that? Right. Come here, Dan. Yeah. Come here. Come here. Yeah. Look, it turned blue. Or, or, it, if it, or was... it turned green. Run. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, and so, but again, why does why does innovation take place? It's, and why is it ex- is it accelerating? And why is it accelerating? And why, you know, was Da Vinci the first guy? And why was it Da Vinci who wrote that down and not somebody else? And why was it Lyle who wrote books about it and those books were published. So yes, of course. And then of course the, there is the, the absolute, I mean, after you invent language, okay, Mm -hmm. good one. And after you invent zero more important, well, it's really, it's the invention of zero, but it's the invention of positional notation systems, right? For which you actually need a zero to make that work Mm -hmm. because Roman numerals are not a positional notation. system. once you've invented a positional notation system, once you've invented that, the next most important thing you got to invent is a printing press. Right. A movable type, which may, which may explain, you know, why maybe, uh, maybe communication was slower in China. Yeah, because they couldn't have movable type. Well, they, yeah, you can, easily. but it's it's a really big room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, right, it's a you really big room. It's not twenty twenty six characters. It's it's you know it's a lot. Well, forty thousand. Yeah. Um. So, but yeah, and I'm always just really worried about yeah, and I, I tend to really shy away from discussing that a lot because it, it sort of turns into this you know uh, comparative you know this my culture is better than your culture kind of discussion. Um. It's just, it's really tricky, but yeah, I mean, why, but clear glass, yeah. the printing press, yeah. um, and also I think another really amazing thing is what I call sort of the multipolar system, which is that in many other societies, um, the king is the priest, is the god, is the society, like one yeah. church, one people, one society, and power is not really separated out that much. There's, it's a monolithic power structure where religion align with the people, align with the language and all that stuff. 
in Europe that gets broken. And you have a multi you have a multipolar power structure where there's a church that has its own independent authority that's often at loggerheads with the actual warlords, which is what they right. are. Right. Right. Yeah, the, absolutely. In the post Roman period. Right. Post, um, you have, yeah, also post Constantinople. So or not post Constantinople, but in Constantinople, in the eastern end of Europe. They were much more closely aligned, the church and the yes. state. The emperor and the church were like one thing. Yes. Um, and the emperor and, was and a god. We should, yeah. yeah, we should actually, I would invite you to read a book called Empress. I think I may have mentioned it by Greg Oliar. Uh, it's a really great fake uh, autobiography of uh, a would-be empress of Constantinople. But you can find it on, on Amazon or something. It's uh, Empress okay. by Greg Oliar. I read it last summer. It was fantastic. Oh, I'll um, read it. Yeah, and it really sh it showcases the difference between uh, the Western European society at the time of well, around 1000 and Constantinople, which was basically a continuation of Rome. Uh, right. Yeah. And in Western Europe, you have, and you also have the rise of an independent intellect, the universities. Yeah. Because it's part of this whole, the, the fiercely independent states of Italy, these city states like Padua. And Pisa, mm. which is where a lot of these universities come from. I think the first university is Pisa. Oh, um, wow. But they're, they're, you know, so you have these, and then you have the press later on after the invention of the printing press, which you always have a multipolar, a multipolar society where we get our ideas via Montesquieu of like div, uh, the, you know, the, the government division of responsibilities, you know, three parts of the government so that they all, it's a game of paper, scissors, rock between everybody. So the system regulates itself. But the key thing is that in Europe, you could run away, you know, and, and there were gaps and, right. and, and if somebody's persecuting you, you could go somewhere else. Um, and if you didn't like the way to they're another doing town here, you with could a different there. system. And also it's just much more, and also it's just, I think it's far less regulated and you could do a lot more wacky stuff and, and come up with these wacky ideas. Um, but I'm just fascinated by, I, I'm just, I'm trying to figure out the thing that really fascinates me is why does Leon, because again, there's no tools. It's not like you need a mass spectrometer. All you have to do is look. Well, I think I think the speed of communication and the ability for communication to survive um, is a big factor, and that also explains why things are moving faster now. Is that the speed of information is exponentially higher than it was in fourteen hundred, and there's more people, and there yeah, there are more people. Um, I think one other thing that this was taught to me by a, kind of a kind of a crackpot uh, professor <laughs> at Haverford. And so I don't know how accurate it is, but I love the idea. So the, one of the idea, we've, we studied the cathedral at Chartres, and one of the things that they had a problem with, because there, there was a building there. You can go back all the way to the Etruscan well that sat on that spot. Um, oh. And uh, if you go to, uh, go to Chartres, which I did, um, you, can, you can stand by that well that, that existed there. It was a place of worship. And then around that was built a small chapel, a Roman chapel. And then around that, uh, you see the remains of uh, older versions of shard. Not that many, because the original ones were built in wood around the year 1000. And they were made to house the townspeople when the devil and his minions were going to, you know, rape everyone and, and come across the land and, and send everyone to hell. Because that okay. was a thousand years since Jesus, right? And that was uh... so time's up. So it was an apocalyptical construction, but it was a big barn and it was made of wood. And of course it burned down, but before it burned down, you know, they discovered you know, the way to protect people is to put a holy relic in there. So they found like a little shard of the Virgin Mary's, you know, cloak. And then, and that was in a, in a little encasing and then people would come and pray and that they would, would protect them from Satan. Um, but they couldn't keep, couldn't keep the house up and they couldn't make it big enough as the town got larger. And the town definitely got larger because people started to flock from everywhere to Chartres because it was a safe place from the devil. And um, there was a lot of business in it, right? So there's all these pilgrims that are coming into Chartres and then the people, you know, you sell them food and whatever they need. So that made the town very successful. And they were like, hey, this apocalyptic building is really great, but we need something better than this wooden barn with the relic inside and there was no technology to build a large stone building okay. at the time. 
Um, and this is where maybe it gets, this is where the crackpot thing comes in. The, the theory, there was a guy named, uh, G- there was Gilbert and then Gerbert, and they, they preceded each other. I think it was Gilbert first and Gerbert. And uh, at some point, G- Gilbert was like, where do we find people who know, to make, know how to make really big, sturdy stone structures? And the answer was uh, from India and from the Middle East. And mm-hmm. uh, they ordinarily, you, you weren't allowed. If you were Muslim, you weren't allowed to travel into, you know, Catholicism, the Catholic land. Christendom. It's like Christendom, right. Christendom is perfect, perfect word. This is around 1100, so 1150. And um, so they made an exception for the Masons who knew how to make a buttress, who knew how to make an arch out of stone that would support the walls, that would allow them to build these really big, tall, impressive buildings that I mean, became cathedrals. Really big yeah. and really tall and really impressive. Yeah, I mean, because Chartres, as we know it, was started in 1150, I believe. Um, maybe took 100 years before it was finally finished, but it's still there. The Germans tried to bomb it, but the bombs that hit the roof of the Cathedral of Chartres did not go off. So how do we get to this point? Now? Well, so my, I, I took us on a tangent because um, I think that there is something not only with the speed of communication, but the inclusivity of the communication, right? So if it were not for right. the exception made to right. uh, Muslim uh, uh, builders to come in and help to build these things, there would not be Western civilization, right? So, and this was back before the printing press and before really any conceivable communication. Um, and everything was probably passed down in a guild fashion uh, from one person to another uh, in terms of how to build these things. But it became very popular. I mean, over the next centuries, a lot of these cathedrals went up. Uh, and it was because it was inclusive of cultures that didn't conform to the culture that was trying to accomplish the thing. And so, the, the, yeah. And you sort of, you sort of, <clears throat> you sort of pushed me in the direction where. I think people have been thinking about these things forever. I mean, it doesn't take a lot of thought to to go up to the top of a mountain. I mean, people have been walking up to the tops of mountains as long as there's been people in mountains. Mm-hmm. And if you get up to the top of the mountain, you see you you chip away at a rock and you see there's a seashell in there. Right. You're gonna go, huh? That's pretty odd. Yeah. <laughs> What's the seashell doing up here? Well, here. either it was down up, it was down there, and yeah. it came up here. Or it, it was created here. Well, the second one doesn't sound so hot, so I'll stick with the first one. It was created down there because that's where I find most of my seashells. Most of my seashells are down there by the seashore, you know, a thousand feet down the slope. So how did it get up here? Well, okay, well, well and and we all need salt, right? And salt is not always sea salt. I mean, it is always sea salt, but where there are on earth salt are you going mines. with that statement? What the hell are you talking? Well, hey, listen, you can take a tangent. This is my tangent. This so is- if once, you know, when people started mining for salt, I'll give you 20 I, bucks uh, just to stop. Talk. All right. Go ahead. Done, okay, right. Cease, no, go, go ahead. Salt. Go ahead. I, I want to see you. Look, I want to see you extract yourself from this one. Go salt, ahead. Salt is all sea salt. Some of the sea salt is mined because it's stuck under the bottom of a mountain someplace and you have a salt mine. You pull the salt out <clears throat> in great big pink chunks. <clears throat> It was there originally because the ocean. <laughs> getting was emotional there. about you. It's getting I, really emotional. It's salt, man. It's, it's salt. salt. These, big, these big chunks. We need it. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So we're pulling the chunks out. Pulling the chunks out. It never occurred to anybody that why the heck is there salt under a mountain? Yes, I'm sure it occurred to people all the time. But the problem is, is two problems. One, uh, many problems. One, you can get your head pushed in. Yeah. If you said to the wrong person. Yeah. Two, it's really expensive to write it down. Yep. Three, even if you write it down, who are you going to give it to? Right. Yeah. Um, Who's going to care? And four, what does it really matter? I can picture like, a guy, an ancient guy, like handing out little leaflets with every packet of salt saying, listen, I have this idea. I think this is actually ancient sea salt from like millions of years ago. And they're like, yeah, yeah. Give me the salt. Right. <laughs> right. No, and they, they, people still are. I mean, right, who cares? And so, therefore, the story of science is just that. It's a story. 
and it's it's a fabricated it's not a fabricated but it's definitely a curated story like the story yeah. of science and, and the one i love um okay you want to go down a rabbit hole you had your sea salt thing i have my <laughs> jacquard lube thing again i go back to what i repeat all over the time which is james burke uh connections and the day the universe changed and yeah, he had yeah. this has this great he has this great episode where he talks and many people know about the jacquard loom which is the fur one of the one of the key first pieces of completely automated machinery mm-hmm. which is it was it was a loom for weaving things but what you had was you had these cards with holes punched in them and right. you could program the tapestry into these cards and they'd go yeah. chung, 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 and it, it advanced the cards yeah well jack Carr was like the fifth guy to invent it <laughs> the first guy who invented it, uh, he was using like something made out of metal that kept breaking. And wow. so it went nowhere. But then his partner took it and went to England and they did something where they put it on paper cards that used hooks to hook them together. And that worked pretty well until that fizzled out. But his loom was given to somebody else and they did it and his thing failed. But he put his loom, his loom was put in a museum. Hmm. The Museum of of Arts and Sciences in Paris, which is this vast or art of technology or something like that, this vast museum of of tools and and uh, you know t- uh, machines for making things. And Jacquard comes along and says, and and he says, oh, that's really cool. I know a way I can make that better. So it was like the hmm. 15th iteration of this right. thing. And so we call it the Jacquard loom, but he's not the, fr- he's not the guy who invented it. He was the last guy who invented it. Right. Um, and so his name is appended to it. Um, and there's, there's millions of examples of this. Um, James Watt didn't invent the steam engine. The huh. steam engine was invented by Thomas Newcomen. Um, or uh, Savory. There's an even earlier guy called Savory. But what happened was James Watt was at a university that had this museum that had a new a model of a Newcomen steam engine in it, which had been used for like many years. The Newcomen steam engine was used all throughout England, but it was ferociously inefficient. And it was mm. only used at coal mines because you had to build the engine right next to its fuel because it burnt so much fuel and did so little that the only way it made any sense was that <laughs> if you if you located right inside a coal mine. Right. Um, and so and and James Watt was was asked to fix this this model. There's a model of a newcomer engine, and Watt was asked, Hey, can you just it doesn't work anymore? Can you fix it? And right. Watt took a look at it and he says, Oh, I can make a better one of these. Yeah. And he did and revolutionized the world. He improved the, he vastly improved the efficiency, but we call it, we say that Watt is the, so what I'm trying to get at, I think people have been discovering things forever. Right. And I don't think, and I think a lot of it is very intuitive. You just, you just need to look, you just need to look. And, and a lot of the things that are called science or from from hundreds of years ago, they make absolutely no sense. Like when they talk about, you know, how how genetics, you know, how people inherit stuff and how people get pregnant. It's like it's totally Looney Tunes. Like it, it's completely contradictory to how the world looks. And the and I'm guessing, again, the, the, the basic point is nobody really cared. Um, it didn't really pay to go against the, the church or whoever was laying down the law at that point, cause they were going to kill you and they're going to burn your books. And there's only like four books in existence anyway. So all they have to do is round up the four copies of your book and you're dead. So, but I'm sure people have been having these, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why it takes so long for people to invent things. And my answer is it doesn't take them long at all. Right. It's just that up until very recently, there's just huge factors working against you that you really don't need a lot of particle accelerators and you don't need a lot of mass spectrographs or anything like that. Um, you just need to, you need a distribution, you need a support network and a distribution network and a society that's going to embrace what you're talking about. And maybe, why, and maybe also a series of libraries, receptacles of the information. That, that right. can be read. Yeah. More importantly, it's not really about books. It's about this. <laughs> this I'm sorry. This is <laughs> and it's six oh one. You got to go right uh, soon. Yeah. Yeah. When you listen to Beethoven, when you listen to anybody, when you listen to the Beatles, mm-hmm. how much of what's going on in your mind is due to the Beatles, 
and how much of it is due to the hundreds of people who've done documentaries about the Beatles and who have written about the Beatles and the things that you saw on the TV about the Beatles and all your friends saying things to you about the Beatles. Um, and so you need a great artist needs a great audience. There are no great artists without great audiences. Yeah. There have been so many talented people who have gone no, uh, nobody knows about them because they didn't have that critical mass of people who would become a viral host. You're going to make me and, cry again. Okay. And, and <laughs> so it's one thing to have a book. Yeah. It helps to have a library. That's good to preserve the information. But what's even better is if you have this lineage of people who share a certain idea and they are willing not only to like dust the books off every now and then, but they're willing to actually read the books yeah. and talk to other people and say, Hey, this guy said this, I think he's wrong, but what do you think? Oh, well, I think he's really right. And, and you have a discussion and you have this dialogue and things keep moving. For, you need that. You need a society and that's maybe why you have things like the Royal Society and you have the, the Linceum in Italy. You have the, 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 the rise of these scientific, of these learned societies. And many times it's not scientists at all because scientists really didn't exist. It's just these – it's usually fairly wealthy people. It's these wacky noblemen, these renaissance men, quote unquote, and women yeah. who get together. And they say, hey, you know what? The Aristotle says this. What a total load of crap. <laughs> right. Does, any, well, does anybody in this room believe to, that? They have to have freedom to criticize somebody like Aristotle. And, they and that's, need, that's the beginning of it. And they need each other. And, they, and, they, and, and right. And it's not just the people in your town. It's, you know, the people that you need to be talking to are not necessarily in Pisa. They might be somewhere in Germany Amsterdam. or they might be in Amsterdam. They might be in China. I mean, there's there, they might be in, Peru, um, in, um, not in Peru. Sorry. Oh, well, maybe. Who <laughs> in knows? Persia. So, you know, yeah. So anyway, it's, that's it. it's, um, yeah, yeah. I think that's we what I'm thinking one. about. I'm thinking about it. It's <clears> the <throat> whole thing about Leonardo. We just had a page in his notebook. He says, oh, obviously the earth is really, really old because if you look at these sediments, they're all buckled up, stuff like that. And I got to go in a flying machine this afternoon. I'll come back to this. <laughs> I'll come back to this next week. It's wow. Like, have people been it's I mean, amazing Leonardo's they didn't kill that guy. How did, how did he escape how did he survive? Being, you know, persecution by the church? How did he survive? Wild. They they hired him. They were like, you know, we need you to do some painting. Yeah, I I don't that I don't understand. I mean, given the 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 tenor of the time. Amazing. Okay, well that would if we yeah. had any subscribers, <laughs> that they're now it. gone. That cured it. <laughs> Meanwhile, okay. something similar. Uh, go to slaps and tell people what you think of their. They're terrible music. No, uh, you yeah. <laughs> know, <laughs> try and be nice. It's actually remarkably nice. I, I find that that's really good. Somebody doesn't like, I think I got one sort of lukewarm comment. Like this reminds me of a lot of stuff from a while ago or something like that. Um, <laughs> you know, they're trying to call me old and like out of date and blah, blah, blah. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's generally pretty positive. Um, at least so far. So, Worth checking out. I'm who, off to, who, yeah. What? Can we have an interview with the guy, with the man or woman who runs Slaps? I don't know them. Um, well, can you just it's, email them? It's run by a pretty big company called, the yeah, Distro Kid is is pretty large company. Oh, forget but, that. But okay. um, I could find out if there's a particular creator of Slaps and whether we could interview them. Check it out know. first. Check it out first. Okay. It, may be, it may be a big nothing. Let's let everybody go home. All right. Okay. Talk to you later, Lionel. See ya. Funny Podcast is produced by me, Jim Infantino. Music by Jim's Big Ego. This solo by Steve Sadler. You can find us wherever podcasts are found. Please leave a rating or review.